thanks to weights and biases for supporting my channel. When researchers were developing some of the first neural networks, they took inspiration from the ways that neurons in our brain weight different inputs and sum them to determine whether or not a neuron will fire. Several decades later, and deep neural networks have become some of the most powerful machine learning models we have due to both the advent of big data as well as something called the Universal Approximation Theorem, which states that a neural network with one hidden layer can approximate any continuous function within a certain range. However, researchers have recently been looking back to the brain to help them solve a new problem. These new brain-inspired computing methods, often referred to as neuromorphic computing, involve both hardware and software. And in this month's AO 101, we'll learn about what neuromorphic computing is, how it might help researchers solve this new problem, and what it might be able to do for us in the future. But before we get into that, be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel if you want to let me know that you enjoyed this video, and leave a comment down below with other topics you would like me to cover on AI 101. Also, if you want to hear even more about neuromorphic computing, this month's Nebula Journal Club is going to be on neuromorphic computing, so if you don't already have a Nebula account, you can watch one video for free to try it out. Alright, so as we've talked about in other videos, when neural networks were first being developed, researchers took a lot of inspiration from neurons. Perceptrons, the main unit of neural networks, were designed to weight a bunch of different inputs and then sum them and apply a nonlinear activation function to see what kind of output the perceptron gave. However, as we discussed in one of my recent videos, neurons and perceptrons aren't actually that similar, and neurons can perform much more complex computations using simpler architectures than neural networks can. In fact, the structure of biological neural networks is one of the reasons why researchers are looking back to the brain for inspiration for this new problem, but not for the reasons you might think. Specifically, this new problem that I've been hinting at isn't a software problem, but a hardware problem. And to understand it, we have to talk a little bit about computer architectures, or how computers are designed. When computers were originally developed, they were fixed program devices, which means that they can only run one program at a time. For example, if you had a computer that was programmed to be a calculator, it would perform calculations, but you couldn't also use the internet or write in a word processor without having to reprogram the computer itself to use a new program. However, in the 1940s, stored program computers were developed, which allows you to store multiple programs on a computer with instructions for the computer on how to run them. And doing this required new forms of computer architectures, or how the memory and CPU and other components of your computer are arranged and connected to each other in order to execute instructions. The von Neumann architecture was one approach to stored program computers, although it wasn't the only one. There's also the Harvard architecture. And current computer architectures are often streamlined versions of the von Neumann architecture that allow for the use of new technology that makes our computers smaller and faster. The problem with the von Neumann architecture is something called the von Neumann bottleneck. In short, there's a limit to how fast data can be transmitted between your computer's memory and the CPU, which executes instructions to run programs. And that limit is slower than the CPU can actually work at. This means that the CPU ends up waiting while data is moved around, which introduces latency, and this becomes particularly problematic when the CPU is trying to perform relatively simple calculations on large amounts of data. Hmm, relatively simple calculations on large data sets. Where have we heard that before? Yeah, so the von Neumann bottleneck is particularly problematic for machine learning. Now, neuromorphic computing isn't the only way to handle this bottleneck. In fact, you can look to parallel computing or alternative computer architectures. However, it is particularly appealing right now because it doesn't require us to develop new hardware, although we can and should, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the video, and can help us reduce energy requirements for machine learning development. Okay, but what is neuromorphic computing anyway? Well, the reason why I've been skirting around the definition of the word a bit is because it's actually pretty broad. Neuromorphic computing typically refers to brain-inspired computing as it relates to anything from chips to software to hardware to machine learning and more. And one of the overarching themes of neuromorphic computing is developing a better understanding of how biological neural networks, from neurons to neural circuits to the whole brain, allow for complex computations, change how information is represented, are robust to damage, but also allow for learning, and facilitate evolutionary change. One machine learning example of neuromorphic computing is the K-tree model, which we actually talked about in my recent video on perceptrons versus neurons. This model is based on dendritic trees and is designed to have both a similar layout to the way that neurons work, as well as similar nonlinear activation functions in places where we don't normally see them. 
Specifically, research on dendrites has shown that they apply a sort of biological activation function to the inputs, in addition to the biological activation function that is applied at the axon hillock where the inputs are summed. And it turns out that you can make K-tree models with a similar architecture and similar nonlinear activation functions, and they perform a lot better than you would expect. In fact, I've actually made a demo of such a K-tree in Collab with some comparisons to a neural network of a similar architecture. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to walk through the Collab notebook like I normally do, but if you have questions, feel free to hit me up in the comments on Twitter or on Instagram. But what about hardware? An example of neuromorphic computing in hardware is neuromorphic chips. Compared to traditional computing hardware, neuromorphic chips typically focus on spike-based computations and near-memory or in-memory computing, where the memory is a lot closer to the CPU, reducing that time that the CPU has to wait in order to process new instructions. They can also incorporate parallel computing to train larger models or work with more data even faster. Finally, a more recent development in neuromorphic computing is flexible neuromorphic computing materials. Ideally, these flexible materials would have the hardware to run neuromorphic algorithms, with the added benefit of being able to be integrated into things like prosthetics and brain-machine interfaces, be designed so that they can take in unusual data types like sensory information, and perform on-device machine learning in real time faster than current chips can. In short, neuromorphic computing definitely has the potential to help us design better, faster algorithms with the additional benefit of helping us better understand the brain. It's also one of the few areas in machine learning where we see a lot of co-development of algorithms and hardware, which has become a popular discussion topic after a 2020 preprint from Google researcher Sarah Hooker called the Hardware Lottery. Her preprint highlighted the fact that the performance of machine learning algorithms is somewhat dependent on the hardware that we run our algorithms on, yet machine learning researchers don't usually spend a lot of time thinking about that hardware past how much computing power it has. In fact, if you'd like to see a video on the hardware lottery and the importance of hardware and machine learning, you can let me know in the comments because it's a topic that I've been delving into recently. This month's AI 101 was made possible by Weights and Biases. If you didn't already know, Weights and Biases makes fast and easy to use developer tools that will help you track, visualize, and optimize your deep learning projects. In fact, their library is used by companies like OpenAI to track ongoing research. I'd highly recommend them to people at any stage in their machine learning journey, and if you have open source, academic, or personal projects that you'd like to try out, you can use Weights and Biases for free. Get started with your own ideas or use their reports to improve your skills and understanding of anything from language models to music generation. And if you have questions or just want to chat, you can join their Slack community. You should also check out Gallery by Weights and Biases, where anyone can read and publish curated machine learning research tools and best practices. It's the ideal publishing platform for ML because you can augment your writing with model predictions, metrics, and custom charts. Even if you aren't interested in developing machine learning models yourself, Weights and Biases hosts regular podcasts and webinars on a variety of topics, so if you like my videos, you'll probably like them too. If this sounds interesting to you, sign up for Weights and Biases or check out the gallery using the links in the description to get started on your machine learning projects in less than five minutes. Otherwise, if you like this video, you can let me know by smashing the like button and subscribing to my channel. And if you'd like to learn more about neuromorphic computing, you can check out this month's Nebula Journal Club, which will be coming out on Wednesday. Otherwise, I'll see y'all on Monday. Bye.